All right, so uh, chapter 14, uh, which is, uh, like I just said, uh, exam four material. We'll talk a little bit about liquids and maybe some solids. I'm not sure yet. Uh, but really in this chapter, we're going to talk about uh, a couple of important things, a little bit about uh, liquids like water, uh, some properties of water. We'll also talk about uh, phase changes. Uh, so what happens as uh, things sort of change phases. And uh, we'll talk about intermolecular forces, which is a really important topic. It, it uh, basically talks about how uh, one sort of molecule is able to interact with another. So the first thing we're going to talk about a little bit is water uh, that we're maybe familiar with, hopefully. And uh, water obviously is uh, colorless, uh, is tasteless. Uh, at one atmosphere, which is sort of normal pressure or standard pressure, uh, at zero degrees, that is the normal freezing point of water. Um, it's also the normal melting point as well. And water goes into the gas phase at 100 degrees Celsius, which basically occurs at the normal boiling point. Uh, between zero and 100 degrees Celsius, you have liquid water. Uh, water is an unusual sort of substance, as uh, most substances in their sort of solid state uh, is usually more dense than in their liquid state. Uh, and actually, it's opposite for uh, water. And ice is actually uh, less dense than, say, liquid water. That's why when we put ice in our drinks, right? It like floats to the surface there to the top because it's actually uh, less dense. Uh, the density of liquid water for most purposes is one gram per milliliter for, uh, and again, that's liquid water. And density does change with temperature. Uh, but most of the time, if you ever need to use a density of water, uh, that one gram per milliliter is usually the unit that you use. As you can see there, basically ice uh, density is about 0.917. And really the reason uh, why ice has a lower density uh, than liquid water is when water molecules basically come together in the solid phase, which is ice, uh, there's attractive forces between the different water molecules. But what it ends up happening is it creates a lot of really open spaces between the different water molecules. So unlike a lot of substances, when waters kind of get together and sort of freeze, uh, they really don't get super close to one another. And this creates this really sort of open volume between the different water molecules. And if you think about the density equation that we learned way back when, density is mass divided by volume. So as they come together, we're really increasing uh, the volume of the overall substance. The result of that is we would have a larger number on the bottom there, and that would give us a much smaller density value that we see in the liquid phase. So in the liquid phase, they're able to kind of come together a little bit closer uh, than when they really sort of lose a lot of that energy in the in the ice stage, and it kind of keeps themselves sort of separated from one another. <clears throat> this is a heating and cooling curve, and actually we'll come right back to it, I think. But first, let's talk a little bit about what happens when we actually change the state of a substance. So remember that when we're talking about states of substances, we're talking really about, you know, how they're existing. And they're solid, right? Liquid and gas are basically our three states. And as we go from sort of one to the other, there are transitions that occur. Uh, we could also go this way or that way as well. Um, <clears throat> the process, right, as we go from, say, solid to liquid, that is the process of melting. Bless you. Going from liquid back to solid, that's the process of freezing. Right? As we go from liquid to gas, that's the process of evaporation or vaporization. As we go from gas back to liquid, that's the process of condensation. We could go from solid directly to gas and skip the liquid part there, the stopover, and that is what is known as sublimation, as we talked about, I think, earlier on. Going from gas back to solid, also skipping the liquid is known as deposition. So as we change states, there's these sort of six processes that could occur, either melting, freezing, evaporation, condensation, <clears throat> 
sublimation or deposition. And they all really do involve energy. So there's a certain amount of energy to change the uh, temperature of a substance. And there's just a certain amount of energy that's required to do nothing more than actually just the phase change, take something from one phase to the next. So there's two types of forces that really um, play a role in you know, the energy required to do those changes and also really what temperature we see these things occur. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about one of them later on in this chapter, but uh, the first one is known as an intramolecular force. An intramolecular force is means uh, within the actual molecule. So it's the actual part of the molecule that holds it together. So for example, if you had a water molecule, the intramolecular forces here would be the oxygen hydrogen bonds, the covalent bonds that are holding that hydrogen to the oxygen on each side is an intramolecular force uh, within the molecule. Uh, for ionic compounds, intramolecular forces is that electrostatic attraction. So the attraction between the positively charged ion and the negatively charged ion. <clears throat> now an intermolecular force is a force that basically holds one entire molecule together with another. And so for example, if we got a couple of water molecules together, as we know from our bonding, water is polar, which means the oxygen side of water is more negative, hydrogen side of water is more positive, and there's an attractive force between this water molecule and the other water molecule through the negative side of one to the positive side of another. As we'll talk a little bit more in depth in this chapter about intermolecular forces, all intermolecular forces are pretty much a basic sort of interaction. It is a basic positive side of one attracted to the negative side of another molecule. So that is basically how all intermolecular forces work, regardless of the type of intermolecular force. It's basically, again, the positive side of one molecule attracted to the negative side of another. And these are the forces that hold uh, a molecule together with itself. So water molecules with other water molecules. It is also forces that hold different molecules together and how they interact with each other. Like if you took something and you put it into water, how they would interact with water uh, are intermolecular forces. So intramolecular forces are usually covalent bonds and covalent bonding and ionic bonding and intermolecular forces are some other type of bonding. In terms of the strength of those two different types of forces, intramolecular forces are always much stronger than intramolecular forces. And we know that from actually the water example here, when we have liquid water and we start to heat it, the first bond that breaks is actually the bond between water molecules, right? And then this guy goes into the gas phase, this guy goes into the gas phase. If it was opposite and the intramolecular force was much uh, weaker, what would happen when we would heat something like water is it would fall apart like alphabet soup. We would break apart these bonds and we would get hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, which as we know from boiling water doesn't happen. Otherwise you really wanna to get to the boiling part. It'd be a little bit more explosive perhaps. Um, so when we heat something like water, that intramolecular force is much weaker than the intramolecular force that holds each water molecule together. So we end up separating out molecule from molecule as we do something like heat it at its boiling point. <clears throat> Any questions on that there? Now, there is, as I mentioned, an energy component uh, when we do something like phase changes. And a reminder, as we go from solid to liquid to gas, those are all processes that require energy to be put in. So they're all endothermic type processes, right? Uh, and if we go the other way, as we go from gas to liquid back to solid, those are all processes that require those guys basically to release energy and lose energy as they're flying around the gas phase and they lose energy, they slow down and sort of clump together into the liquid phase. As you continue to remove energy from it, they're able to kind of come together a little bit more into the solid phase. So going in those sort of directions, uh, those are all exothermic type processes. 
And also a reminder, when we talk about endothermic and exothermic in terms of values, and if we calculate values, endothermic values are typically positive or negative. Endothermic are typically positive type values. So when you calculate energy and you get a positive value, that usually means that it's endothermic. And exothermic usually results in negative values being uh, basically achieved. So when we talk about the transition of a substance from solid to liquid or liquid to solid, basically this transition going from solid to liquid or backwards, the amount of heat required to do that is what is sometimes referred to as the molar heat of fusion are most oftenly displayed as the delta H of fusion. If you remember, we talked about it in the energy chapter, delta H is the enthalpy, and this is sometimes referred to as the heat of fusion. The heat of fusion is the amount of energy that's required to simply take a substance from solid to liquid or backwards from liquid to solid, not change the temperature. This all occurs at the same temperature. So for example, water goes from solid to liquid and liquid to solid at zero degrees Celsius. So if you had ice at zero degrees Celsius and you wanted to take it to liquid water at zero degrees Celsius, the heat of fusion is the amount of energy required to do that. In the case of water, it's 6.02 kilojoules per mole, which is roughly about 333 joules per gram is roughly the amount of energy that's required to do that. And that means that if we were going from solid to liquid and we want to convert ice into liquid water, you would have to put in there a positive 333 joules per gram. And if you wanted to go from liquid to solid, you would have to put in there take out negative 333 joules per gram. It is, again, basically the same amount of energy, regardless of which way you go. Uh, the sign is just different, as we talked about when we were talking about energy, uh, to represent, uh, is it exothermic or endothermic? Any questions on that there? Now, to do the transition of going from uh, liquid to gas or gas back to liquid, that, by the way, happens at the normal boiling point. So the normal boiling point of a substance, that is where that transition happens. And for something like water, that is 100 degrees Celsius where that occurs. And if you wanted to take water from liquid to gas or backwards gas back to liquid, the delta H of vaporization is what that is sometimes referred to, the heat of vaporization. And for water, it is about 40.6 kilojoules per mole, or roughly 2260 joules per gram is the energy required to take liquid water at 100 degrees Celsius to basically steam at 100 degrees Celsius temperature not changing, just simply changing the phase of that particular substance. It would be the same thing going from liquid to gas, which is an endothermic process, positive 2260 joules per gram. Going from gas to liquid, which is an exothermic, minus 2260 joules per gram. Which one takes more energy going from solid to liquid or liquid to gas? Transition from liquid to gas is 2260 versus solid to liquids is only 333. It takes a lot more energy to go from liquid to gas than it does go from solid to liquid. And that is because as you go from solid to liquid, everybody is still relatively close to one another, right? In that sort of liquid phase. But when you go from liquid to gas, everybody needs to completely break apart and they go into the gas phase and are now completely flying away from each other and all around. So it takes a lot more energy to get everybody to separate out into that gas phase than it does to go from solid to liquid where there's just still a little bit of association there. Any questions on any of that? There? <clears throat> 
So how does this relate to say that curve that we just passed up on the last slide? Let's take a look at it. So this is a heating and cooling curve for water. And obviously as you go uh, kind of up this curve uh, from ice to liquid water to steam, uh, we're heating as we're going back down, we're cooling. Uh, so ice here is really our solid state, right? Obviously in the middle here is our liquid state. And up here is our steam, which is really our gas sort of state. So here we can see for water at zero degrees Celsius. That is where we have the transition occurring from solid to liquid and backwards liquid to solid. Right here on this plateau, right? Line, it, it means it is flat. It is not changing temperature. It stays zero degrees all the way through that transition. It's not until you get a little bit above zero degrees Celsius that you're actually in the liquid phase. Not until you're a little bit below zero degrees Celsius that you're in the solid state, but exactly at zero degrees Celsius. Both processes are really happening at the same time. You have like ice crystals. So you got a little bit of solid there. You got a little bit of liquid sort of happening at exactly zero degrees Celsius. Now that is where the heat of fusion will come into play. And that was our delta H of fusion. And once again, for water, it's approximately 333 joules per gram. If we come up here, this is 100 degrees Celsius right here. If I could draw a straightish line as I'm scribbling that. And it was sort of straight there before I scribbled on it. And again, that means that the temperature is really not changing. So that is the normal boiling point. And this is actually a normal boiling point for water, which is 100 degrees Celsius. So once again, at exactly 100 degrees Celsius, you basically have both phases happening. You have the liquid and the gas together. Uh, and again, it's really not until you get above 100 degrees Celsius that you sort of transition into the gas phase, not until you get a little bit below 100 degrees Celsius that you're still in the liquid phase. But again, right at 100 degrees Celsius, we do have uh, both phases sort of happening. Uh, and that is, as you can see here, where we would have our heat of vaporization happening, or delta H of vape. And that is, again, for water, 2260 joules per gram. Depending on which way you're going, either it will be positive or negative as you go sort of in that direction. Now, <clears throat> bless you. As we look through these things, how does this relate to sort of other things that we saw? If we look at this graph here, all through, say, just above zero degrees through this liquid part here, that is everything that is in the same phase, but the temperature changes. And when we have something that changes temperature, but is still the same phase all the way through that, that is where we use an equation that we saw in an earlier chapter. That is our good friend, specific heat. Q equals MS delta T. So if you remember, we used that in an earlier chapter. That specific heat equation is used when we have a substance that basically is in the same phase, but the temperature changes. And that would allow us to figure out how much heat is required to change the temperature that is there. A reminder on this equation, right? Q is our heat, which is either joules or calories. Uh, M is our mass, which is grams. Uh, we have S, which is our specific heat capacity for liquid water. By the way, it is uh, 4.184 joules per gram per degree Celsius. And that is for water in the liquid phase, by the way. And our delta T, which we talked about, which is really important. We always want to do final minus initial. And this is one of the few places, as we talked about, where you leave the temperature in degrees Celsius. Uh, because that usually the specific heat capacity is still in uh, degrees Celsius. So there on the heating curve, we would use our specific heat equation. Also, if we were up in this range here, for example, or even down in this range here, those are also places where it's the same phase, but the temperature changes. So we would use our specific heat equation here. Q is equal to MS delta T and down here as well, 
Now, if I did use my specific heat equation up there in the top part, in this area here in the gas phase, and we're talking about water, should I use 4.184 for my specific heat capacity for water? The answer is no, because that's for liquid water. For steam, the specific heat capacity for water in the gas phase is actually about two joules per gram per degree Celsius. So it actually is a different value if you happen to be in sort of the gas phase. And it also is a different value down here. If you happen to be in the ice phase, uh, the specific heat capacity of ice is about 2.03 joules per gram per degree Celsius. So uh, sometimes you may have a problem where you may need to delve into say the ice phase or the gas phase, and you wanna make sure that you do use sort of the correct specific heat capacity. Uh, in the case of water, those are the typical values. But again, if it was some other substance as well, you wanna make sure that you get the specific heat capacity in your gas, liquid, or solid. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> So how does this relate to say a calculation? Let's take a look at one here. Let's say we took, let's say we wanted to know, how much heat is required to change, we'll go with 125 grams of ice at, Let's do minus 2.0 degrees Celsius to steam at 100 degrees Celsius. So if we want to know the amount of energy to do all these things, we could kind of look at our diagram here that we were just looking at and follow along. I'll draw a bad version of it here. All right, so again, this is ice, this is uh, liquid water, and this is steam. And this obviously here is about 100 degrees Celsius, and this over here is about zero degrees Celsius. So it's kind of similar to the uh, graph we were just looking at there. All right, so the very first part of this would be, we're actually starting at, minus two degrees Celsius, which means if we sort of look on the graph, uh, we're somewhere in this area here, and we actually need to take it up to zero degrees Celsius. So we got to go from minus two to zero degrees Celsius. It is ice through that whole process. So really the first step would be to take it from minus two degrees Celsius to zero degrees Celsius. And this is all still ice. Because it's the same phase through that whole journey there, uh, that means that we do want to use our specific heat equation. So we would use our Q is equal to MS delta T. Putting in our mass, which is 125. Remember though that we are at the specific heat here of ice. So we wanna make sure we use the ice specific heat value of 2.03 grams per degree Celsius. And remember that we wanna take our final temperature minus our initial temperature, which in this case would be zero minus, point, or minus two degrees Celsius. That's important because taking final minus initial in this case is gonna turn my negative into a positive in this case which is what it should be. It should be endothermic in this process. So we take 125 times 2.03 uh, times two, basically. And it gives us an amount of energy here of 507.5 joules. And that is the energy required to simply go from minus two degrees Celsius to zero degrees Celsius, still ice through that whole journey. Any questions on that so far? The next thing that we need to do is we're now sitting at zero degrees Celsius as ice. We have to do the phase transition from zero degrees Celsius of ice to zero degrees Celsius of liquid water. So the next process here would actually be 
doing the phase change here at zero degrees Celsius. And that is going to take us from zero degrees Celsius ice to zero degrees Celsius liquid water. And that's going to require the delta H of fusion to be used. And for liquid water, we'll use 333 joules per gram. So we're going to now calculate the amount of energy to do that phase change. And we would take the same mass, 125 grams. We would times it by the heat of fusion, which I will use the version converted to joules per gram. And that would give me 125 times 333. Going to give me, looks like, uh, four, one, six, two, five joules. So that amount of energy is the amount of energy to actually do the phase change, take it from solid to liquid at this point. At this point, I am now sitting at zero degrees Celsius liquid water. The next sort of transition that's going to occur is I need to take that liquid water from zero degrees Celsius all the way up to the boiling point at 100 degrees Celsius. So the next step that would occur is I would have a transition where I am now going to take it from zero degrees Celsius liquid water all the way up to basically the boiling point, uh, which is 100 degrees Celsius. Through that entire transition, it is all liquid water, which means same phase, but I'm changing the temperature so I'm going to use my specific heat equation here to do that. So the third step here would be to go from zero degrees liquid water to 100 degrees liquid water. And once again, that is gonna be Q equals MS delta T. So whenever we stay the same phase, but change the temperature, that is the equation we wanna use. Q would equal our mass, which would be 125 grams. But now in this case, we are in the liquid water sort of phase. So we do want to use our normal sort of liquid water specific heat capacity of 4.184 joules per gram per degree Celsius. And again, we're going to do final temperature, which is 100 minus initial, which is zero. And that gets us 125 times 4.184 times not a thousand, a hundred would be good. Gives us 52, 300. Any questions so far? I am almost to where I want to be. I am now sitting at a hundred degrees liquid water, but I want to end up not at a hundred degrees liquid water. I want to end up at a hundred degrees steam, which is gas. So the last step that we have to do in this case is actually to do another phase change, take it from its boiling point at 100 degrees Celsius, liquid water to 100 degrees Celsius gas, basically. And that would be this fourth transition that needs to occur, which is to go there. So the very last step that we would have to do in this process is to go from 100 degrees liquid water to 100 degrees steam. And that is our delta H of vaporization. And again, here for look for water, it's about 2260 joules per gram. So the last thing here, we will take our 125 grams using our heat of vaporization, 2260 joules per gram. Gets us the amount of energy to do that transition. About uh, 282500 joules. As you can see in comparison for the transition from liquid to gas versus solid to liquid, a lot more energy is required to do that step. Yeah. Any questions on any of those steps? <clears throat> Now that I have actually hit the last part where I want to be to find the energy required to do that entire process, I should do what with all those numbers? Basically, you should just add up all the numbers for each of those steps. So to find the total amount of energy, we would add up all the energy numbers 
since I'm running out of room, I'm just going to say for the total energy, it would basically be add up number one plus number two plus number three plus number four in terms of the energy for each of those steps. And if we do that, step number one, we had uh, 507.5. Step number two, we had 41625. Step number three, 52300. And step number four, 282500. Gets us a total amount of energy of 37693.2.5 joules. And if we want it in kilojoules, which is probably a common sort of one, we'll round it to like 377 kilojoules of energy would be necessary in this case. This is going from ice to gas. And as we talked about, that is all endothermic, right? Which is why all of our numbers ended up as being positive. And our overall values also ended up as being positive. First off, any questions on that? <clears throat> to finish up on what would be the only difference if we started at 100 degrees gas and ended up at minus two degrees ice the only difference is each of these numbers would end up being negative right and the overall would be negative if we were going the other way uh this guy would flip around and give us a negative number uh if we were going the other way this guy would be negative 333 and this guy would flip to give us a negative number, and this guy would be negative, and we would end up obviously with a negative value going the other way. Yeah. Wow. Uh, by a thousand to convert to kilojoules. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's joules. And then uh, from, yeah, to go to kilojoules, again, remember there's a thousand joules in a kilojoule. And that's how we got down here. Yeah. to convert it to kilojoules? Yeah. No, there's really not. You could, let, you could have left it in joules if you wanted to. Uh, you could also convert it to kilojoules. A lot of times uh, kilojoules is the most common sort of unit that's given uh, for that type of process. Thank you. All right, other questions? All right, we will see everybody in lab.